Hello, this is uh, Dr. Viv again. So for this video, we shall um, get into some vector algebra and some vector calculus. So I have selected some problems that uh, we should uh, think about solving. So the first one asks us uh, to prove for any four vectors, A, B, C, and D, uh, that notation means that these vectors live in three-dimensional real space. That's where the R3 comes from. And the R in parentheses means that it's over the scalar field of the reals, which means that you can multiply any of these vectors by a real number to get a bigger or smaller vector. So um, that's our notation R3R. So the we have to prove in general, that is to say, we cannot choose any specific A, B, C, or D, uh, but for any general A, B, C, and D, uh, the following is true. A cross B dotted with C cross D is equal to A dot C times B dot D minus A dot D times B dot C. So first let's see if this makes sense. A cross B, the cross product of two vectors gives you another vector. And that's same here, another vector. And the two vectors can be dotted to give a scalar. And this side is a scalar because it just multiplies a bunch of dot products and subtracts them. So at least it uh, looks sensible. A uh, few other things you can see about this. If you interchange C and D, um, you're gonna get basically the minus sign because this becomes the other term. And so these terms interchange. And so you get a minus sign as you should because the cross product is anti-symmetric. So that's, that'll be a fun thing to prove. Now, once we prove that we can show a Jacobi identity, I'll explain what that means. Um, then suppose we have U and V to be two vector fields. A vector field is a vector that's very smoothly over the entire space and in a continuous fashion. Smoothly means it's differentiable infinitely, infinitely many times. So that's what this symbol chi um, with a uh, slash to the middle means. So that's the uh, vector fields over the space R3, which means that each of these things, U for example, will be a function of X, Y, and Z um, and you will have three components, ux, ui, and uz, and each of those is also a function of x, y, and z. So that's what a vector field is. Uh, we'll write some things down. So this is a much more complicated um, problem to prove. The divergence, or the, or the gradient rather, of the scalar product of u and v is some sort of a complicated uh, triple curl, and then you have two gradients here. So we'll get uh, that also. And the last one is I thought I'd just uh, throw in a fun, uh, innocent kind of a problem. Uh, if this determinant is zero and the vectors A, B, and C are uh, not in the same plane, which means they're not complanar, um, then find the value of A, B, C, where A, B, and C are real numbers. So. Uh, these are three very nice problems, which I thought I'd spend some time showing you how to solve. Okay, let's start with uh, the very first problem. Now, in proving these, I'm going to use abstract notation, uh, which means I'll be using uh, summation notation of Einstein. So just to review that, the Einstein summation um, notation or sometimes called the convention of Einstein is the following. Einstein came up with this because he was tired of writing summation signs. So when you have two vectors and you take the dot product A dot B, um, you're gonna get something like uh, AX, BX uh, plus AY, BY uh, plus AZ, BZ. 
Now, one way to do this is to say that x is equal to one, y is equal to two, and z equals three. So that'll be the sum from i equals one to three, uh, ai bi. Now, Einstein made an agreement with his readers that whenever you have these repeated indices, it means that they are summed over their natural range. So Einstein would write this simply as AI BI. So repeated index means that you sum over um, these indices. Okay, so uh, that's the Einstein summation convention. Now, based on that, we can also write the cross product. Now, generally speaking, the cross product uh, A cross B is uh, given as the determinant. So this is gonna be the determinant I hat, J hat, and K hat, where I hat, J hat, and K hat are the um, uh, three Cartesian uh, unit vectors. So you have along the X axis, I hat, along the Y axis, J hat, and along the Z axis, K hat. They are the unit vectors in R3. Um, then you write A1, B1, A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3. That's how you traditionally define the cross product in undergraduate classes. Now, if you write this out, you're gonna get I hat. So the way you expand the cross product is to assign these uh, signs and those signs are assigned based on negative one to the power uh, row number plus column number. So for example, that's row number one, column number one. So that's gonna be negative one to the power one plus one or negative one squared, which is plus. Uh, let's try this one. That's uh, row one and column two. So that's gonna be one plus two and that's negative one to the power three, which is negative. That's how you get the negative there. So once we have fixed those signs, we can expand this out. And the way you expand it is um, you ignore the uh, row and the column here and write down the entries exactly as they appear. The next term is negative j hat, negative because of that. And then you leave out this and this and write down the rest. And then the last term is uh, k hat times, leave this out, leave, leave that out and write this down. A1, A2, B1, B2. And then you repeat the same procedure for the two by two matrices. However, the two by two matrices, um, you know, if you repeat the same procedure, you're gonna get a plus here, a minus there, Um, so let's do this. It's gonna be I hat times A2 plus A2 times what's left, and that's just B3, minus A3 times what's left, which is B2. Now, if you observe this, that's A2, B3 minus A3, B2. So it's a major diagonal minus a minor diagonal. So that's an easier way to think about it. So let's do it like that. That's A1, B3 minus A3, B1. Uh, plus k hat a1 b2 minus a2 b1. Uh, this is one way of writing the cross product. It's actually a very bad way of writing the cross product because to prove these identities, you cannot just keep doing this all day long. It will be a terrible waste of time, very inefficient. So we're gonna use the symbolic notation of the cross, cross product. So that symbolic notation uses what's called the epsilon tensor. So the ith cross product element is given as epsilon ijk, aj, bk. Now observe, we are using Einstein summation. And whenever I'm using Einstein summation, I'll put an es within pointy brackets. You can see that I'm using Einstein summation because j and k are summed over and because they are repeated, but i is not repeated. 
you observe that uh, i is a free index. You have to have a free index on the left side. So i is a free index. Okay, uh, j and k are repeated and hence they are summed over the natural range, which in our case is uh, just uh, r3, i equals um, j equals one to three, k equals one to three, that's a summation. So we have this. Now, how is this related to that? It actually is the same thing. Let's figure out what the first component is, a cross b one. That's gonna be epsilon one j k, a j b k. Now the epsilon i j k tensor, um, this is an introduction to it if you don't know what it is. So um, it's a tensor that whose value you get by the following method known as a magic circle. So if you go from i to j, j to k, and k to j, then you're going with the flow. If you go against it, you're going against the flow. So under these conditions, you can assign uh, all the values for epsilon i, j, k. So uh, first of all, epsilon with any two indices repeating is zero. So for example, epsilon 112 or 133 or uh, two, uh, two, two are all zero. The only epsilons that survive are six in number uh, and the ones that go with the flow. So one, two, three, epsilon, um, two, three, one. I can either write i, j, k, or I can write one, two, three. Uh, so that's, I'll write another magic circle. Small magic circle for the one, two, three part. Um, so that's equal to epsilon three, one, two. And all that will be equal to one. If you go against the arrow, so that will be something like epsilon uh, three, two, one, or epsilon two, one, three, or epsilon one, three, two, that's against the flow. And so that gives you minus one. And it's zero for everything else. So it's a convenient um, tool. It's a tensor. Normally a tensor of uh, three indices has 27 elements, uh, but only these um, six elements survive and 20, uh, 21 elements are zero. Now let's see um, if we get back the definition of the cross product. So that's one j k. The only values allowed are j equals um, two, three, or three, two. The first index is fixed at one. So the only two I have are two, three and three, two. So let's write them both. So this gives me, this is equal to epsilon one, two, three. And since j is two, I should put the two here. And since k is three, I should put the three here. Uh, plus epsilon uh, one, three, two, a three, b two. Now epsilon one, two, three is plus one. Epsilon one, one, three, two is minus one. So I'll write that down. That's gonna be a two, b three minus a three, b two. Well, in this way we have successfully got the first component of the cross product. This uh, index A cross B1 means that that's the first component. So this is just A cross B1. And similarly, A cross B2 will be that, A cross B3 will be that. Uh, when you do A cross B2, you will get this negative sign. So uh, that's uh, um, an introduction to how to use these abstract notations. Now that we have all these notations in place, uh, we are ready to solve the problem. Okay, our first problem is to prove that identity over here. These identities were first discovered by Lagrange. So they are sometimes called Lagrange's identity, but uh, there are so many of Lagrange's identity that it's just probably not worth naming anything. Let's just call it identity. Uh, <clears throat> so we have to, um, solve that. Now, one, what we can do is to break this down. That's two dot product. So for the moment, let's call 
that's called capital A, let capital A be equal to A cross B and capital B equal to C cross D. Then what we are asked to prove is A dot B is equal to all that stuff to the right. Now A dot B by Einstein summation is just AI BI. So what we really need is uh, to show is what we need to actually expand out is A cross B I times C cross D I. So each of these, we can now write in terms of the epsilon uh, tensor. So I can write this as epsilon I J K A J B K. And that's gonna be epsilon I. Now there are many alphabets in the English language. Don't use J and K again. J and K are what are called dummy indices. You've already used them once to sum them over. So this I is non-negotiable because you'd need to have the I index, but the other two indices should be something completely different. So let's use um, PQ or something like that. CP, TQ. Uh, so what we have now is uh, two epsilons, epsilon i, j, k. These epsilons are scalars, so they can be brought wherever you want to bring them. And then all this is lumped together. Now there is a uh, famous identity known as the double epsilon identity, and that's what we need to use here. The double epsilon identity can be used whenever you have the first index the same. If the first index is not the same, then you have to use magic circle to make the first index the same. Uh, we'll look at that in, in this problem. We'll have to do that moving around using the magic circle. Otherwise, you just get this, uh, the double epsilon identity, which I'll write here. is the following, uh, epsilon i, j, k times epsilon um, i, p, q is gonna be the product of two Kronecker deltas where you take the first index, the second index here and the second index there. So that's gonna be j, p, the third index, the third index. So that's gonna be k, q minus delta, and now you take the second index and the third index. So it's gonna be JQ delta KP. So that's the third and the second. So go go with the order here and go against the order there. Uh, of course, I doesn't come because I is summed over. So the index I is summed over. So the only free indices are JK and PQ. Only JK and PQ should occur on the right side. These Kronecker deltas, Kronecker was a uh, famous mathematician who made a statement that uh, God made the integers, all the rest is the work of man. Um, so Kronecker delta uh, is defined as follows. Um, for example, delta LM is equal to one if L equals M and zero if L is not equal to M. So it's like a on off switch. If the two indices agree, then it's one. If, it, if they don't agree, it's uh, zero. Uh, if you wanna think about how to represent delta in, uh, in a matrix uh, representation, uh, you would do it as follows. So delta LM written as a matrix, which I'll indicate by putting a brace around it, would be one along the diagonal and zero everywhere else. So that's the uh, matrix representation. of the Kronecker Delta. But anyway, once you have the double epsilon identity, things get really smooth. So let us uh, figure out what A dot B is. 
a dot b is equal to, I'm gonna replace the double epsilon with, uh, with this. So it's gonna be delta jp, uh, delta kq, minus delta jq, delta kp, and then all of this, aj, bk, cp, dq. What these deltas have to do now is to feed on this. A delta can only feed on something with the same index. So J, P can only feed on either a P or a J. Now I like to make the convention that uh, it feeds on what's the second index. So we'll put the uh, CP with delta JP and KQ with DQ. We'll just have that convention. So I'm gonna get uh, delta JP with uh, CP, delta KQ with DQ, and then the remaining two indices will just go for the ride, and that those indices are AJ and BK minus, we'll do the same sort of feeding procedure here. JQ will feed on DQ. KP will feed on CP. And the remaining two indices will go for the ride. All right, now when the delta function acts, it is zero unless J is equal to um, P. So you have to have or other P equals J. So this has to be CJ and here it's zero unless uh, Q has to be equal to K. So that's gonna be D K. And then that's A J B K just as it is. Minus here, this will be zero unless um, the two indices are equal. So I should have Q equals J. So that's gonna be D J. And here it will be zero unless P equals K, CK. And the remaining two indices go along for the ride. And now let's interpret this. Uh, AJ and CJ together is just A dot C. Uh, BK and DK together is just B dot D minus AJ and DJ together is A dot D. And BK and CK together is just B dot C. In this uh, miraculous way, we have actually proved the first Lagrange identity. Uh, you almost don't see it happening till the very end, uh, but it's proved. And this is what a proof really means. It means that you have proved it in complete generality without making any sort of assumptions about A, B, C, and D. Let us now go on to the um, um, second problem. The second problem is the problem on uh, vector calculus. So when we wanna solve a vector identity, we have to be careful. So first of all, you notice that uh, there's hardly anything you can do with the left side. So we should probably stick to uh, the triple cross products. They involve more things than you can do with the, the triple cross product, more things using epsilon, i, j, k, and so on. So we'll not worry about these dot product things. We'll instead try to see, we'll just try to see what u cross del cross v is, and then we'll interchange v and u and we can find out what that is. And then hopefully when we add them, we'll get the remaining three terms. So that's gonna be our strategy rather than ask, uh, you know, start with the left side and show the right side, which is probably gonna be impossible to do unless you've done it once before and you're trying to fake it. So uh, what we're gonna do is uh, play, play the game like that. 
So that's going to be u cross um, del cross v. Well, the cross product, so we need to have the ith component of that. Well, that's going to be epsilon ijk times uh, uj times del cross v k. So think of it as just another vector. This del cross v is just another vector, which it's going to be, because when you take the curl of a vector, you get another vector. So this is going to end up being epsilon ijk uj times del cross vk. Well, that's going to be epsilon klm. Remember, plenty of alphabets out there. klm and the um, lth component of del, which I'll write like this, del l vm. Okay, now the two epsilons come together because they like to be together. Uh, epsilon ijk, epsilon klm, and then uj del l vm. Be very careful because um, derivatives, you have to be very careful about how derivatives act. You cannot just move things willy nilly because you have the Leibniz rule or the product rule of differentiation. Now, this is almost uh, where we want it to be. Remember the tools at our disposal are the uh, double epsilon identity, which is this one, uh, but the first index needs to be the same. The only index that's common to these is K. So we need to bring K somehow to the front. And that's where we're gonna use the uh, magic circle. Now remember the magic circle that I had was this. IJK is the same as JKI is the same as KIJ. So what I can do is instead of writing it as IJK, I'm gonna write this as KIJ because that's what my magic circle tells me. And that's epsilon KLM. Nothing changes here. Just write it down exactly as it is. Now the first indices are the same. And so the um, magic um, circle formula can be used. Let's uh, see what that will be. You're gonna have, um, I usually write, like to write the deltas first and then fill in the details. Gonna have a pair of deltas multiplying uh, what they're gonna eat and they're gonna eat that. So to fill the indices, I, L, J, M, and that's I, M, J, L, in the opposite order, same order, opposite order. And that's it. Now remember the feeding procedure, uh, I, L will feed on del L, so this time I won't uh, bother showing you the full details. I'll just tell you it's happening. IL will go there and change the index there to I. JM will go here and change the index to M. So I'm gonna get UM del I VM minus, well, let's see what happens here. IM will go there and change that to I. JL will go here and change that to L. Now you may wonder, uh, how do I know whether I have to change uh, J to L or L to J? It doesn't matter because when you get UJ uh, del J, it's the same as UL del L. The index, the dummy index is always summed over. So that's what I have. Now, I don't have to repeat. I don't have to repeat everything for V cross uh, del cross U. It's just replacing U by V and V by U. So the ith component of that is just gonna be VM uh, del I UM minus VL del L UI. So it looks like we got more than we bargained for. Uh, remember the original problem 
asked us to show that the sum of these two terms is equal to three terms. Uh, well, the sum of these two terms is now four terms. So hopefully two of the terms will combine. Okay, that's our hope. So now let's uh, combine them. So therefore, U cross del cross V, ith term of that plus V cross del cross U, ith term of that. Uh, I just realized I had not proved the corresponding Jacobi identity. I'll quickly tell you what that is after I finish this problem. Uh, forget things. So I have here, um, write down whatever I get, um del i v m minus ul del l v i plus v m del i u m minus v l del L U I. I'm actually seeing uh, a few things already. Um, okay, so these, well, one, one, the other thing we can try doing is to simply take these and see if they reduce to that. So that's um, an option. If you cannot think of anything else, that's definitely a um, fallback option. Um, okay, so that's, um, if everything fails you, you can always try that out. So let me do that. I'll uh, look at what needs to be shown. So I'll collect all those terms together. So I'm gonna have uh, um, del u dot v minus u dot del v minus v dot del u. That's probably the simplest procedure. We'll call this equation star. And we'll hope that when we reduce this, this also becomes star, okay? Um, so we'll say now, what is this equal to? Well, by the, uh, the we, need, we need the ith component of this, the ith component of all that, because that's the ith component of all of this. So the ith component of all of this is gonna be del i, uh, u dot v is just uh, u m v m. I'm just picking some arbitrary index to sum over, minus u dot del, uh, I'll say it's uh, u j del j, vi, the free index has to come on the vector. Uh, v dot del, I'll call that v, uh, vk del k. I just wanna show you that when there are plenty of letters around, you should not use the same letters, ui. So that's what we have. Now uh, let's try to uh, simplify this. Del i, now this you can use the Leibniz rule, also known as the product rule of differentiation. So this is equal to Vm times uh, del i u m plus u m times del i v m. And then here you're gonna get those terms, uh, uj del j acting on vi minus vk del k acting on ui. Let's see, do we have something similar? Yep, these two agree. So whenever something agrees, I'll uh, put a red underline. Those two agree, uh, these two agree. So I like to change my underlining a little bit. What about those two? Uh, well, they also agree, except if we agree to put uh, L instead of uh, L instead of J here, but those, those are dummy indices, they can be summed over any way you want. 
you can put an L or a J, it doesn't matter. So that's those are those two are the same. And of course, you just put, move the parenthesis to that one. And then here, instead of K, you put L and you'll be done with that. You get that too. So I'll call this wavy, wavy red. So we see that uh, this is also star. So we are done. And when you're done, you put this Latin thing called QED, which means uh, quad erat demonstrandum. It means that which was to be proved. Now, uh, I just promised you to go back to the Jacobi identity. What is the Jacobi identity for this uh, uh, first problem? A Jacobi identity is just a cyclic sum of all the things. So here's a slight uh, interlude. There are Jacobi identities in every aspect of mathematics. Uh, a Jacobi identity is just a symmetric sum of certain things. So the Jacobi identity for the first one would be, uh, for the first problem would be the following, A cross B dot C cross D plus, and then you rotate the indices, A, B, C, D. Um, so you make this C cross A dot B cross T. And then plus um, A cross B. Uh, well, that's already here, so we can't use that. Plus um, uh, B cross C. dotted with A cross T. And that sum is equal to zero. That follows by simply writing out all three terms and showing that they cancel pairwise. So I won't, I won't bother doing that. I'll leave it as exercise to you. Um, so just to see uh, how this works, A, B, C, D, uh, B, C, A, D, and then C, A, B, D. Okay, that's the rotation we have. The rotation is only on A, B, C and not on the D. The D is the last thing that remains fixed. So we have a magic circle involving A, B, C. While setting up the Jacobi identity. So A, B, C, uh, B, C, A, C, A, B. All right, that's exercise for you. You'll get uh, terms looking just like that and they all cancel out in pairs. Um, so uh, we'll go on to the next problem, the problem number three. Uh, this problem is actually interesting uh, because uh, it gets into the notion of what it means for three vectors to be linearly independent. Uh, we also have to introduce a new kind of uh, product known as a triple scalar product. which I abbreviate TSP. So the triple scalar product of uh, three vectors is indicated like this, A, B, C. Sometimes commas are used to separate them, but I tend not to use commas. That's just the, um, the it's defined as A dot B cross C. And where you put the dot, it doesn't really matter. This is the same as A cross B dot C, etc. And if you want to write this in terms of a determinant, you'll get this as determinant of A1, A2, A3, uh, B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3. So it can be written in terms of a determinant. Now the triple scalar product of three uh, vectors is a very useful uh, tool in, in vector algebra because it tells us when the three vectors are in the same plane or not. Um, now, uh, you may have learned in your elementary uh, grades that A cross B stands for the vector area of a parallelogram. Uh, 
let me draw it. So if I have uh, the vector A here, Um, and a vector B, then A cross B is gonna be into the page and a vector into the page is denoted by the uh, tail feathers of an arrow like that. So that's A cross B. But the direction is into the page, but what's the magnitude? The magnitude is precisely the area of this parallelogram. So if you extend this, uh, parallelogram and you find its area, then the area of the parallelogram is precisely uh, what you know to be the cross product magnitude. If this angle is theta, then the um, area is just gonna be AB sine theta. All right, so the vector area of a parallelogram, it's not just the area, but the area with the sign. The sign in this case is into the page. If you dot this with a further vector, if you take a dot b, a cross b and dot with c, then what do you get? The dot product projects the vector onto the um, component on a cross b. So if I take c, which is some vector outside, let's say like that, and I project it, then it's gonna be some scalar. Now, if the projection is not zero, it means that c must be uh, outside a cross, the plane of A and B, okay? If the, if the vector C is in the plane of A and B, the projection is gonna be zero. So this tells us a, it's a useful criterion, the triple scalar product is a useful criterion to decide when three vectors are in the same plane or not. So uh, three vectors are said to be in the same plane or uh, are coplanar if their triple scalar product is equal to zero. Uh, conversely, uh, three vectors are not coplanar if their triple scalar product is not equal to zero. In this case, the three vectors are also said to be linearly independent. Linear independence is a very important quantity uh, concept in um, higher mathematics. It tells you when the basis of uh, vectors can be used as a basis for the entire space. So that's the uh, uh, fundamental theory for this problem. Now let's go ahead and solve the problem. Uh, first of all, we have to use some properties of the determinant the term determinant is a linear operator. So we can split this up nicely. So I have um, the left side, it's given that that's equal to zero. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, this is a solution to problem three. I'm gonna write this using the properties of the determinant as a, a squared one, uh, b, b squared one, c, c squared one plus a, a squared, a cubed, uh, b, b squared, b cubed, uh, c, c squared, c cubed. And we have been told that that's equal to zero. So this is, I get by using the property of the determinant. When you have a plus sign, you can just break it up into two determinants like that. The other property of the determinant we can use is that when you have uh, a factor that's the same, you can pull it out. So A is the same in the first row, B is the same in the second row, and C, the factor of C, I have in the third row. So uh, the, uh, then here I'm gonna use another property of the determinant, which is that you can interchange rows and columns twice, then nothing happens to the sign. So again, it's like the magic circle. Go from here to here, and then from here to here, and the one comes over there nothing changes, okay? So I get one, 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 A, B, C, A squared, B squared, C squared, plus A, B, C times one, 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 A, B, C, 
a squared, b squared, c squared. And that's equal to zero. Well, this can be written as one plus ABC times one A A squared, one B B squared, one C C squared is equal to zero. Now, when a product of two things is zero, either this or that must be zero. But we have been told that A, B, and C are non coplanar. So given uh, A, B, and C are non coplanar, which means that they don't lie in the same plane. In other words, the triple scalar product of A, B, C, which is a determinant of all the A things, and then all the B entries, and then all the C entries. Well, we are told that that's, that's not zero. That's what non-coplanar means. If this is not zero, that's forced to be zero. Therefore, one plus ABC must be equal to zero. And that tells you immediately that ABC must be equal to negative one. In this way, we have found the value of the product of ABC. So uh, that's the end of this uh, video. I hope uh, you learn a bit about vector algebra and some vector calculus operation. Uh, FYI, if you're wondering what the DELs and, and DEL are related by, uh, let me just give you the information on that real quickly before I conclude. The gradient uh, NABLA is, um, stands for I hat del by del x uh, plus j hat del by del y plus k hat del by del z. I'm gonna, uh, I've abbreviated this as I hat del one plus j hat del two plus k hat del three. So the component, if I write the ith component of the gradient is simply del i. Okay, so that's just the ith component of the gradient.